different hit here this time. I'm going to be playing this guy's video about Jeremiah 23. Now, he doesn't know. He, 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 watch what he does. And I'm going to expose these lies as we're supposed to do so. So in, uh, I think it's what, Ephesians chapter 5, talking about the fruits of the Spirit and exposing these lies. This is a, hey, he seems like a nice guy. We could probably go golfing together. But he's lying to all of those people in his congregation. And it's no different than anybody else is going to do this, this sermon. So I'm using one of the nicer guys. And what I like about him is he, compared to the other guy I watched, he actually reads the Bible fairly quickly. Now, this is going to take a while. I'll, pro, I'll tell you right now, it is an hour long just to listen to him. I fast forwarded to, I think you might not be able to see right there. That's nine minutes and 37 seconds. If you ever want to watch this video, he is blatantly lying. He knows some things, and I want to make sure you guys catch on to that. He understands that there are two houses, at least that there was, and he's missing the, the prophecy of this whole chapter. This chapter is speaking, he speaks against himself in, this, in his own teaching. So I'm going to point these things out for you to watch. So we're going to listen to him. And uh, if you can't hear it very well, you got to let me know. I'm going to stop talking now, and I'm going to interrupt him every single time he lies, okay? I might let him lie a couple times to get to the bigger lie, uh, if, if, I can, if I'm able to do that. I watched him yesterday. It's terrible. This is a terrible thing. And, and the, the other guy I watched was just as bad as him, if not worse, okay? So this guy has somewhat of an honest... He's trying to be honest, but he's lying right through his teeth. It seems like he's wanting to be honest, but the sheep in wolves' clothing, or the wolves in sheep's clothing, are going to look like the sheep, you guys. So let's let's do it. It's at the point where he's going to do Jeremiah twenty-three. Three deals with a passage that is very, very important and. Uh, disturbing in many ways for all of us, any of us that are involved in shepherding, pastoring, whether raising kids, whether serving in Sunday school, whether working with guys in a Bible study group or in ministry to any degree, listen to what the Lord has to say. Woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock. You've driven them away. You have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. In other words, these shepherds in Jeremiah's day were not feeding the flock of God. Now, right there, this is end days prophecy. It's talking about today. So he's, he's trying to deflect and say it's about the end days or the, the days of Jeremiah's day. It's not. Jeremiah was, this is to the house of Israel, Okay. The house of Israel was already gone, okay? So Jeremiah is prophesying about the end days. And I'm going to give you a quick uh, spoiler on this one. Read verse 20. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he has executed, until he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider this perfectly. He's talking about the very, he's going back from verse 20 to the beginning of the book, okay? So let's keep going. They were not teaching, feeding discipling, visiting, mentoring. Rather, these shepherds in Jeremiah's day were in it for their own enrichment. They're and let me just reiterate that because they're scattered to the four corners of the earth and he's going to call them back. This is not talking about the time of Jeremiah's day. He's deflecting. Own reputation, their own satisfaction. They were not feeding the flock. They were fleecing the flock. And God indicts these shepherds, so-called shepherds, saying, you're, you're not feeding my people, but I'm going to bring one who will feed my sheep. Be careful, watch out. 
if, if, if people are trying to manipulate you to support their thing, raising money for their deal, be careful, be cautious, because so many people, sad to say, in the name of ministry, with huge uh, money-making machines to cause fundraising activities to happen and manipulation and all the rest, they're, they're not really necessarily there to feed the flock. They don't give the word of God. They're not discipling, but rather they're just wanting to fleece the flock. And this is what the Lord is indicting those shepherds for in that day. But the day will come, verse 5, saith the Lord, I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Capital B. It speaks of, of course, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Oh, in his days, Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called. Now, do you know what he just did right there? I'll tell you what he did. He says, this is what he says. In his days, Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell safely. That's not what the Bible says. He's reading the King James. It says, in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. Because it's talking about two houses. And these shepherds that is being spoken of are not feeding the flock. They're fleecing them, like he said. They're making merchandise of his people and teaching them lies. This man is just as much of Balaam as anybody else. Just because he's not as successful as, what's the guy's name? What's that rich guy's name? Uh, one of the, anyway, any of those mega church pastors. He's criticizing guys that are above him in pay grade, but he's actually one of the ones that is a prophet for hire. He doesn't do this without getting paid, all right? That's why God says, I'm going to raise up watchmen in the last days. I told you already, the anger of the Lord shall not turn until he has executed, until he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it perfectly. That's in about 15 more verses. This is all prophecy about the end days. The Lord, our righteousness, or Jehovah said canoe. Right now, these shepherds are ripping off my flock, God would say, and it is his flock. But one day a shepherd's going to come who's going to rule and reign and teach and love and care and shepherd and protect my people. That man, of course, verse 5, is the righteous branch, the king of kings, and his name will be the Lord our Righteousness. Jehovah said canoe. Who is the Lord our righteousness? The Lord, all capitals, meaning... I'm going to interrupt again. Let's go to what he's talking about in a different book. So when that, the Lord reigns over us, this is what he's going to do. And it shall come to pass from, that, from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come and worship before me, says the Lord, and they shall go forth... And look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for the worm shall not die, and the fire be not quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. That's the punishment to those guys. That is calling the least in the kingdom. That's what it means. Those who are called least in the kingdom will break the commandments and cause others to do so and teach others to do so. This is exactly what he's doing. Because how is he going to get, yeah, how is he going to get the, the flock uh, or how is he going to save the or uh, teach the flock that Ten Commandments? All right. Right now, it's by faith that we follow the Holy Covenant because it's in the refreshing of the covenant. You know, when it's talking about the the the, the new covenant in Hebrews eight, nine, ten in there, when it's quoting Jeremiah thirty and thirty one, which is just a little ways up from here where we're reading in Jeremiah twenty three, it's still by faith. He hasn't taken the stony heart out of people's hearts yet and placed the new one in. This is Jacob's time of Jacob's trouble where the Gentiles are going to go through tribulation, but Jacob will be saved out of it. That's when he brings the house of Israel and the house of Judah together as one. And this is why they're not feeding the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's there because they're scattered into the Gentile church. Jehovah or Yahweh, 
Tzidkenu means our righteousness. Who is this one? It is Jesus Christ. This will be his name. This is what he'll be known as. This is what he'll be called when we see him as he rules and reigns on the earth in the second coming. This will be the name that he will be called. Yahweh Sidkenu, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. You are our righteousness, Lord. We're not righteous. We're sinners. We know what we are. But you are our righteousness. You paid the price on the cross. You hid us in yourself. You robed us with your righteousness. You are our Savior, and we're going to call him that. The Lord, our righteousness, Jehovah or Yahweh Sidkenu. That will be the name. Even as in his first coming, he was known as Yehoshua, or Jehovah is salvation. Yeshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, or Jesus, a contraction. Jesus is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Yeshua, which is a contraction. Okay, so what he's doing right there is making excuses for the, the Romans' uh, um, Greek winter solstice demigod. Jesus, okay? It wasn't the Greek rendering Jesus. It was Jesus, okay? And it's that later on, the name Jesus came from the rendering of their winter solstice demigod that they caused everybody to uh, fall into sin doing Saturnalia and Easter, which everybody's about to do tomorrow. That's why these guys aren't feeding the sheep, my friends. This is, he's preaching right against himself. You know, Yehoshua, Shua is salvation, and Yeho is Yahweh. So the name Jesus means the Lord is salvation. Yes, indeed. That was the name in his first coming, Yeshua. But in his second coming, he'll be known as the Lord, our righteousness. Uh, I came across a quote um, a couple of days ago that I thought was interesting. It was found in John Trapp's writings, who was a great Puritan preacher, and he was actually quoting Martin Luther. And he declares this, the Lord, our righteousness, rest in Jesus. He is our righteousness. And then this quote, quoting Martin Luther, you, sir, Satan, your menaces and terrors trouble me not. For why? There is one whose name is called the Lord, our righteousness, on whom I believe. He it is who hath abrogated the law condemned sin, abolished death, destroyed hell, and is a Satan to thee, O Satan, Martin Luther said, in the way only Luther can. Hey, I'm not afraid of your accusation, Satan. I'm not fearing the flames of hell because the Lord is my righteousness and he has become a Satan to you, Satan, an accuser to you. He's going to put you in your place, but we are hid in his righteousness. Beautiful quote, I love that. So this is what the Lord is going to do. There might be all kinds of failing shepherds that fleece the flock, all kinds of false leaders, all kinds of bogus ministries, all kinds of selfish, uh, ego-obsessed personalities in preachings and ministries, but there's coming a day when the Lord is gonna show up. What a day that's gonna be. And watch this also for you students of the Bible. It's the Lord, our righteousness, Jehovah Tzidkenu. That's his name. It's Jesus. But wait, the Lord, our righteousness, the Lord, Yahweh. If it refers to Jesus, verse 6, and it does, verse 5 makes that clear. If you're following the text, it's the branch, the righteous branch of David, the coming king. It's Jesus, and that makes Jesus Jehovah. And the Jehovah Witness cannot answer this text because this text declares that the branch of David, who's also the root of Jesse, for you Bible students, he is the one who is the Lord, Yahweh. That's him. See? So, so right now what he's doing is telling you guys that Jesus and God is the same being, and that's not true. So where he says the Jehovah Witnesses can't answer that, he's just twisting this to f suit his own doctrine. So, you know, that's, that's what he's saying. He's using the word Jesus. So, anyway, we'll just continue on. He's talking a lot about Martin Lucifer and whatever, which is just a bunch of nonsense anyways. 
he's going to start getting into the second. This is where the second exodus is mentioned in Jeremiah 23. And watch how he doesn't have a clue about what he's talking about. He, Jesus, is Jehovah. And this verse is irrefutably proof of that reality. So when somebody knocks on your door on Saturday, just turn them here. Say, how do you deal with this? Who is the Lord our righteousness? They'll say, well, that's the Father. Well, take the context. Look at verse 5. It's talking about the one who would come of David, the righteous branch. And that's Jesus Christ exclusively. Well, therefore, verse 7, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth which brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, but rather the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, Babylon. And from all countries, when Christ comes back, he declared there on the Olivet Discourse, in the Olivet Discourse, he'll send his angels to gather his people, his elect, from all countries, speaking of the Jews specifically, and they'll come from all countries. The Lord, not... Do you see what he just said? He's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel because they were scattered to the north country. This is already in many other prophecies. This is the whole prophecy about Ezekiel chapter 4 and Leviticus 26, the 1200, uh, 2730 days, sorry, which is what Romans 10 and 11 is talking about. And they're going to and they're going to rise up when he quotes that, they're going to rise up out of the Gentiles when the Gentiles go apostate. And they're going to be angry at a foolish nation, which is quoting the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. And God is going to abhor guys like this. Well, he brought us out of Egypt in the days of Moses historically, but he's brought us out of all countries, from everywhere, from the four corners of the earth, the Jewish people brought back again to Israel, to Jerusalem where the Lord will rule and reign as the king, the descendant of David, the branch, the royal one. So this speaks of that. He's brought them out of all countries where they had been driven, and they shall dwell in their own land. Now Jeremiah says, verse 9, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. These false prophets that are prophesying peace. You. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord, because of the words of his holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of the swearing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil. Their force is not right. Oh, he declares, my, my heart is broken. I'm weeping. I stagger like a drunken man. Because these false prophets have caused lies to be heard in the land where are the true shepherds is what he's declaring here you got that right the prophet and the priest he says are profane the prophet and priest profane now watch how he explains taking... watch how he explains what his version of profane is he profanes that which is holy the holy covenant now he's going to start turning it to his own self-righteousness. Watch this. That which is sacred and making it unholy. Profanity, profaneness. Sad to say today, and I, I'm just being real frank here because we are living in Jeremiah times. We are seeing the death of a nation. We are seeing the unraveling of a culture. We need a revival. We are seeing now preachers that use profanity in the pulpit and thought to be so cool. So many young preachers now, not just young, sad to say, but they think swearing is cool. That is using hell and damn and talking about, uh, you know, other stuff in a profane way. And they think it's real cool. It's real cutting edge. It's really stupid and it's very wrong. When you use profanity, you're, 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 you're in a holy place, church, amongst holy people, believers, holding. What he's doing right now is deflecting the attention off of himself, profaning the holy covenant. And he's, because of his own self-righteousness, because he doesn't say a swear word like damn or hell, he is saying, look at me, I'm very... 
you know? And yet, he's pointing the finger at those. He's trying to put blame on other people rather than his own self. That's what he's doing. The Holy Bible. We need to realize that you're on holy ground. And it must not be profaned. Profanity is really wrong on many levels. It's the devil's language to do what? When hell is tossed around, oh, blankety blank, go to hell. Or damn, I'm mad. Or whatever these preachers are saying today, and many are because it's considered cool now to be drinking brews in a pub and swearing while you're studying the Bible. And it's not right. It is W-R-O-N-G, which spells wrong. Why is profanity wrong? Profanity always deals with holy and high purposes. Hell is real. But you toss it around in a profane way, that word, or damn, which means doomed to lostness, and you toss that around in a vain or lame way. It loses its power. Are you listening? It loses its power. People are used to hearing hell and damn, and consequently, when the word of God addresses those issues, and it does, it's been profane. Sexual acts are profane. What is supposed to be holy and sacred and exclusive and guarded becomes tossed around by these ultra uber cool preachers in a way that causes it to be no longer sacred. So I'm just going to interrupt again because he's really... He's going to do a lot of yapping in between verses and it gets people distracted from the flow of scripture. So what he's going to get into here is that uh, both the prophet and the priest are profane. Yea, in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Wherefore their way, their way shall be unto them slippery ways in the darkness. She, they shall, shall be driven on and fall therein. I will bring evil upon them even the year of their visitation. Says the Lord, I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria, which is the northern kingdom. They prophesy in Baal, which is Jesus, and cause my people Israel to error. He does not like error. We have the Holy Spirit of truth. One will come in his own name, him you will receive. I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. That's what Yeshua says. I have also seen in the prophets of Jerusalem. Oh, now. Look at what this says when 14, it changes the tone. I have also seen in the prophets of Jerusalem. Now it switches to the, the southern kingdom at this point at verse 14. Right now, he's speaking against his own self. Please listen to that. The northern kingdom. Pretty special, but it's profane. And so, hey, that's why body parts are also part of profanity. Why do people laugh about body functions? You know, animals don't do that. Dogs don't think it's funny to talk about body functions or body parts. But people, why do people think it's funny? Because there's a diabolical, devilish, demonic plan behind it. And that is, it's always the body parts that deal with intimacy, reproduction, sacred matters. And if those can be profaned, the devil's plan is to profane everything that is holy and high and sacred and special. And consequently, if it can be talked about in a callous, crass kind of way, those words and those things lose their holiness. They become profane. It's very important that you avoid profanity, that you don't go there. I don't care how cool it's becoming in the Christian culture today. Speak words of purity and holiness and righteousness. Self-righteousness. Guard your words. This is what he's talking now, about. Now, another aspect of profanity is, is cursing. It's the stupidest thing you can do to curse. You know, you're working on a project in your workbench. You hit your thumb with a hammer and you curse. Oh, blankety blank. There's power in words. What you're doing is... You're making the project you're working on all that much more difficult. You're invoking the forces of hell, darkness, and demons to be a part of the project. Okay, do you hear what he just said there? Now he's, he's letting you know that when you do these sins, like 
the words that come out of your mouth, which is true, but he's basing it on his own self-righteousness, okay? When you do Christmas and Easter, you invoke the powers of these demons he's talking about. So what he's saying, he's going about what he establishes as his own self-righteousness, preaching it to the whole world, because he's right here on, on the internet doing this right for us, right now, and to his whole congregation. He may not swear or he may not make jokes about farts, for crying out loud. But that's what he's saying, that those people who make jokes about farts are who are the profane people going to hell instead of those people doing Christmas and Easter making their pagan witchcraft in the house of God. Uh, and that's why they're not feeding the, the sheep of Israel. Good luck with that. Cursing is counterproductive. It's not only profane in the sense that you're reducing sacred and holy issues and important stuff, even hell and damnation, to making it gutter talk or loose talk, it loses its power and potency. But you're also invoking demons to be a part of what you're doing when you use such terminologies. In other words, please don't swear and curse and be profane and crass. Speak carefully. Guard your lips. Ask the Lord to help you. Put away toilet talk and cursing and profanity and all of that type of thing, let it not be named, as Paul said, once among you. Paul talks, we don't have time to go there tonight, but suffice it to say, this is being addressed to preachers. You, 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 you've profaned everything. You're profane. You've reduced things to, to profanity, to commonness. Yea, in my house I have found wickedness, saith the Lord. Verse 12, wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. Wow. You're going to be slipping in the darkness. You that involve yourselves in that kind of uber coolness or profanity or not shepherding my people in my love and according to my word, but according to your own dreams, you see, you're going to be on a slippery slope in the darkness. That's not a good place to be a slippery slope in the darkness means you're going down. They shall be as those on a slippery slope in a dark place. Verse 12 goes on to say, they shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. I will hold them accountable. Understand this. Whether you're parenting, Sunday school teaching, uh, sharing in music or speaking to people or Whatever we might be doing in any degree, we're going to be held accountable. We're going to stand before the Lord. Now, our sins are washed away, but we're going to give an account of what did we do with the opportunity with our kids or with that Sunday school class or with that Bible study group or whatever it might be. And it says here that the Lord declares, I'm going to deal with them on the day, the year of the visitation of the Lord. I'm going to visit. I'm going to <laughs> deal with. The Do you notice how he said, but our sins are going to be washed away. He added that in there. That's his own false doctrine right there. These things. I have seen the folly, verse 13, of the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and have caused my people to err. I came across a, a message that was recommended to me by one of these uber cool preachers of the day uh, with his beer in hand and all of that stuff. And his message was basically revolving. He had a verse or two that he shared, but his message was based upon the I Ching, uh, Taoism, and the wisdom of the Tao. And uh, I, I thought, really, this is where we're at now with recommended, highlighted teachings where we're getting our instruction from, 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 false gods and false religions and false philosophers, God forbid, God forbid. But that's what they were doing. They were giving, well, now here's what Baal says. And here's what Baal worship. You see, you see what's going on right there? That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. That's the name of Baal. 
They have. They're going to receive this other name. And he even knows his name is Yeshua. He admitted it earlier in the video. But you can't have your cake and eat it too. And that's what narcissists do. And here's what Baal. Now, they weren't saying don't listen to Jehovah or don't walk with Jehovah. They were adding Baal to Jehovah. And God says, I will not stand for that. Don't add human philosophies and false religions as a part of the message that you share with your kids or talk about with each other. It's the word of God. There's enough in here to talk about every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every year of every decade of every century until you die. The word of God. It's here, folks. The word. These shepherds weren't doing that. They were also including what Baal worship had to offer and what Baal philosophers had to say. See, they have prophesied in Baal and caused my people to err. I have seen also, verse 14, the prophets of Jerusalem doing a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They strengthen the hand of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and as Gomorrah. They're involved in immorality. They speak untruths perpetually. Look at They're Tel Aviv right Gomorrah, now. Even as Sodom Tel and Aviv. Bragged of their perverse sexuality. In other words, God is saying, my shepherds. My leaders, holiness is no longer being talked about, taught on. They're talking about Baal. They're profaning everything. <clears throat> They're not caring for the people. They're leading them astray. And God declares, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> I don't worry about morality. Just be happy. Be nice. Everything's going to be okay. It's reggae religion. It's Rastafarianism. It's not the Bible. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what they were doing. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets. Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall for the prophets of Jerusalem profaneness or from the prophets of Jerusalem profaneness or profanity has gone throughout all of the land they're going verse 15 says these prophets are going to be bitter and you watch these uber cool preachers that are profaning everything and these uber cool churches that say Hey, we're not going to talk about the way you should live according to the word or what God is asking of you for your own benefit and blessing. It will result in bitterness. It results in suicide. It results in depression. It results in anger and hostility. And it spews out from people that are not teaching the word or obeying the word, or searching the word, but seeking to profane it. They will be filled up with wormwood, with gall, bitterness, you see. They'll become bitter. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, verse 16, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, for they make you vain. The word vain there means both empty and or haughty. The prophets, they're giving you emptiness and they're making you vulnerable to haughtiness. That is, there's nothing substantial there. And you just end up walking out with a big head thinking that you're really hot. I'm hot. But God would say, no, you're really not. And there's some adjustments we need to make. And there's some things that you're involved in that are going to take you down. And there's some danger signs here. And there's some wisdom you need over there. 
I hope you guys are listening to this. In Jeremiah's day, would not do that. They refused to do that. So they made the people. It says here, they gave and made the perk people vain because they speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They talk about what they, they want to talk about. They don't talk about what God has declared. We need to get back to the Bible. Amen. Hey, peace, everybody. Okay, so what you're hearing right? is that oh, all that stuff already happened. Jerusalem got destroyed. That's what it's talking about. Jeremiah our Sabbath uh, gathering on the MySpace on Twitter. You're all welcome to join. And um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna pull out Ezekiel 9 and, and uh, Jeremiah 17 probably about the destruction of Jerusalem when the 144,000 come back with the Lord. That's one thing, and they're gonna say peace. No, no destruction is gonna come here. But the Christians are also doing the same thing. Oh, pre-trib rapture, pre-trib rapture. When it says that I'm gonna gather them from the four corners of the earth and they're gonna come to their own land, you see? We just read it, or he just he just told us all about it. But I'm sure he's going to have some kind of pre-trib rapture uh, talk himself, you know. There's so many things when he's talking about the imagination of their own heart. This is what it's talking about. You're not saved by your works in Ephesians 2. The imagination of your own heart is your own works. And that's what it's talking about in Ephesians 2. You're not saved by your works, your imagination, the you know, works of your own hands. All that so, it's so much mentioned in the Old Testament, and that's what these prophets are talking about. This is, uh, I don't know if he's a Mormon or not. I don't know, the, what's the name of the church? Have a look, check it out. His name is uh, John, J-O-N, Corson, C-O-U-R-S-O-N. So, but he's no different than the other guy that was preaching either. These guys try to attempt to preach these things, and they don't know. And it does, see, one will, will preach against the Jehovah, you know how he's using Jehovah Witnesses? The Jehovah Witnesses are in error. The Baptists are in error. The Alliance is in error. The Mormons are in error. The, everybody's in error because the whole entire church went apostate. There's only one denomination, one, and it's called the way. And these guys all have their own take on it. And every single one of these guys is not gonna, is not gonna listen to the prophecies of the scriptures even though he's gonna pretend that he does and he's gonna claim that he does because he's deflecting. That's why he's deflecting the curse against his own self for what he's doing in the very chapter that he's reading to everybody right now. And it's so easy to see. When they don't feed the sheep, they're not feeding them the 10 commandments. The 10 commandments, that's why it says at the beginning, raise up my own shepherds. That's why we do this now. That's because he raised us up. It's already going on. This is already coming to fruition. So when people start following the Ten Commandments, no, that's the revival. This is in uh, Daniel 11 and 12, that he's going to raise up his own men, and they do know their Lord, and they are going to guide many to righteousness, and they are going to do exploits against those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And that's why these guys, they tack each other rather than looking at their own self in the mirror because none of them are following the Holy Covenant. Therefore, none of them have the Holy Spirit of truth and therefore all of them have the Antichrist spirit of error and that's why the Lord is going to intervene and raise up the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's not just talking about the 10 tribes. When he said it's specifically talking about Judah, he's not telling you the truth. The northern kingdom's gonna rise up. They're called Ephraim. It's just like Judah represents um, Benjamin, the Levites that are with them, and Judah. There's three tribes in the mix of Judah. One name, his name is Judah. But in the northern kingdom of Israel, before the, the tribes are actually separated in there and his stuff, well, when that happens, until it happens, oftentimes the house of Israel is always referred to as Ephraim. Ephraim. So when Ephraim rises up, then all of a sudden around the four corners of the earth, that true Israelites that God has already preordained to rise up out of the Gentiles, they're going to start popping up, springing up like grass, it says in Isaiah 44, and they're going to start surnaming themselves by Israel. I am Jacob. I am of the Lord, or I am the Lord's. That's prophecy already happening amongst the people right now. That's why 
by Malachi 3.16, I bring that up as well. A book of remembrance for the northern kingdom of Israel. And when he returns Judah a second time, a second time. So he's already returned Judah. They're there right now. He's telling you prophecy that's happening right now. And they're there. And that's why he mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah, because what's Judah doing? It's going right to pride, gay pride, Tel Aviv. It's right there, sodomy. That's the, their unrighteousness um, in adultery. Adultery is, uh, is, is wickedness, you know? It's, it's uh, fornication. It's uncleanliness in sexual um, con conduct. You know, and they're just allowing it to all happen there, you know, because they're whoring with the beast. They're not tearing down any of the altars, the Christian altars. They let Christmas and Easter go on there. They name the name of Tammuz, and uh, there's three other pagan gods in their Hillel calendar, their pagan Hillel calendar. You see, that's why Judah was commanded. Judah, do your solemn feasts, not your traditional feasts, the solemn feasts of God. They received the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they rejected them. They rejected the correction. And the Christians are doing the same thing. It's don't go to the right or the left, you know? That's what's going on right now. So you guys stay in the middle. There's a lot to be said about this. We probably talk about the unjust steward in our group today, which will be in a couple hours. One to, th one to three hours, it's gonna start. Anyways, we'll go back to this guy yapping at the mouth about all his lies. I hope you guys can see and hear clearly what he's saying because it's absolutely ridiculous. How, how it, it's so easy to know that you're in the truth when you hear a guy like that, a paid professional, totally butcher the scriptures. Then you know, you know, and then the people just lap it up. That's foolishness to me. It's absolute foolishness. Like you have to be able to see this. I hope you do. Buddy, don't worry about a thing. Don't worry. Be happy. Because every little thing is going to be all right. Rastafarian religion. A perverse. Look, you're all winners. You're all great. Positionally, that's true in Christ. Practically, there's a whole lot of work that he wants to do in me. That he's working on. That needs to happen. To make me the man he wants me to be both in this life and for eternity more important. But these prophets wouldn't do that. They said peace. And they said to everyone, hey, no evil shall come upon you. It's okay. For who, verse 18, hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard this word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. You're going to see in the last days. You're going to know that God's word is true and unchanging uh, whether it's a personal life or a prophetic plan whether it's a nation or a culture as it plays out down the road you're going to see we're going to see that God's word is right and those that ignore it or delete from it or refuse to listen to it are going to come up short you're going to consider it in the latter days, you're going to see it's perfect. I have not sent these prophets, God says, and yet they ran. They're running around, but I haven't sent them. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. He says, but if they had stood in my counsel, verse 22, and caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Who is a true prophet, a true pastor, a true leader, a true parent, a true person, a true teacher? It's one that turns people from evil ways. Not encourages them to continue in sin. Not that sugarcoats God's word. Well, we'll get to Galatians in due season. 
all of God's word is important. All of it. All of it. And it all manifests itself perfectly in Jesus Christ, the word become flesh. Who is so winsome and so loving and so gracious. Who also spoke more on hell than he did on heaven. Who pronounced death difficult things to those that thought they were doing okay. Who rebuked his own disciples for not growing and having faith like they should. Jesus is the real deal. The word made flesh. And so too, the word here, it's, it's sharing the full truth. And God here declares these prophets running around, brigations, he says, I have not sent them. If they really were my prophets, they would have turned the pieces that I don't see him, saith the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard these prophets that prophesy lies in my name, that saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. People love prophets that talk about dreams. I have a dream. Martin Luther King preached that day. Perhaps the most famous sermon in our generation. A dream when there shall be equality and when men, where, where men shall not be judged by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character. Good stuff. And yet, no word of salvation. Everybody applauds. People have posters in the day when posters were in bedrooms and dorm rooms and all that. I have a dream. I have a dream. Martin Luther King was a preacher of the gospel. I'm not trying to put down that speech, but that's not God's word. That's a personal dream. But if you're going to be a minister, a reverend, a preacher, a leader, Make sure that you're not sharing your dream. Make sure you're sharing God's word, the scripture, the Bible, the full counsel of God. These prophets, they prophesy lies. They talk about their dreams. I have dreamed a dream. I have dreamed. How long, verse 20, with their own heart, which means their own heart is deceived. That's the interesting thing. They're deceiving others, but they don't even know it. Because they... What keeps a person from buying into your own lies? Your own mistakes? By not being in the Word of God. The Word of God hits me in the face in a wonderful way, day by day by day. I find myself going off in this direction in my thinking, or that direction in my theology, then I read my Bible. And it's like, man, I go, okay, thank you, Lord, thank you. Thank you. But see, again, not being done. And these prophets, they deceive themselves. They prophesy lies, which, verse 27, think to cause my people to forget my name. My name. I often tell young preachers, if you can cross out his name in your sermon and your sermon still stands, if you... Now, I want you to notice something very, 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 very important right there. He's been spending all this time trying to accuse other people. Now it's coming to another detail. They're going to prophesy in my name. Or they're, gonna, they're, they're not going to prophesy in his name, but they're going to prophesy in the name of Baal. This pastor is criticizing... And that detail is that they're going to prophesy in the name of Baal. Guess who that is? They're all doing it. All of, the, all of them are doing this. They're all prophesying in the name of Jesus. That is not the Messiah's name. If you don't believe your own Messiah prophesying himself about what you're going to do, then you're just going to find yourself in your own boatload of trouble. Because he warned us that the whole entire world will be deceived except for the very elect. And the very elect are the ones that are going to start telling you the truth. Because we already he, this pastor already told you he's going to raise up his own shepherds. 
Because these shepherds, he, he, remember what he tried to do? He tried to say it was back in Jeremiah's day? No. This is all about today. This is all end days prophecy. In the latter days, you will consider this perfectly. Oh, hey, Mickey. I haven't seen you in a while. So anyways, so as he's sitting there pointing the finger at everybody else, he's all these fingers are pointing at him. You know, because he's right there lumped in the same thing. We were told to become like one man, not 50,000 denominations. He is one of the same false pastors out there. So continue on if you want. I see a lot of people dropped off the live, but it's worthwhile to actually educate yourself on these matters. X Jesus out of your message. And it's just a lot of still doesn't hurt to serve me. You can do nothing. Jesus, the power of the cross, powerful stuff. But these guys, it says, my goodness, they caused my people to forget my name by, by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Now the prophet that hath the dream, watch this. This should be underlined in a lot of our Bibles. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Yes, what is I the will. Chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord. Now, if you have a dream, there could be a place for that. See, now, another thing that he points out, he's talking about all these guys getting punished. Oh, but we're, we're washed in the blood, he says. Now, we're talking about what is the chaff to the wheat. We already know what's going to happen to the chaff. They're going to get burnt and, and taken away. They're going to be gathered first and burnt. He's not going to approach that because he wants you to believe you're saved no matter what you can do as long as you confess Jesus. And that's not what this gospel says at all. His name is Yeshua. He comes in the Father's name. He keeps us in the Father's name. Yah. That's what his, his uh, objective was to do. And it was because I want my children... He requires that his children worship the Father in spirit and in truth, not in the lies like this. That's why he gave us his word so we would know. These guys have corrupted and perverted his word. Now, I'm going to tell you what he's going to say, or I'm going to let you listen to what he's going to say in the next bit. This is all talking about the burden of the Lord when he gets into it. The burden of the Lord... In the latter days, remember, you're going to consider this perfectly. Yeshua quotes this part of the scripture when he's telling you, don't you dare blaspheme the Holy Spirit of grace. This is in Matthew 12, 31 to 37. Matthew 12, 31 to 37, when Christ is quoting the next part of scripture about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit of grace. Grace is Conviction on our heart to follow the holy covenants ordained of old. The Ten Commandments, the Rainbow Covenant. And these guys aren't going to teach you that. And blasphemy, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is saying, saved by favor, causing grace to become favor. You are saved because God just favors you. That's what he's, these people teach. And that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So he was preaching against himself the whole time. I'll interject when I feel fit to do so, but I'm going to try to let him continue on so that we can finish this video because I told you from the beginning it's going to be long. It's an hour long, just him talking. He's 41 minutes in now, so if I can let him talk, he'll like that at the end, so his sermon will only be a, a little, uh, whatever that. The wheat bows so down. Many Christian books out today. I just, I read them, I browse them, and I say it's just a lot of chaff. Where's the word in this? Do you hear this guy lying? Where's God's word in this? What is the week to the chaff? It's dreamy. It's interesting. You're dreamy. But where's the word? Oh, yeah, but it just makes us feel so close to God. or We just get so inspired from that story or from that dream or from that book. And I say, well, where's the word in that? Is it lining up with the word? Is it revolving around the word, or is it just some dream? It's chaff. What's chaff? It's, it's blown away. It doesn't feed anybody. 
the prophet that has a dream, okay, if you have to talk about your dream, okay, but what is the dream? It's chaff. What is the word? It's wheat. The prophet that hath a dream, well, let him tell a dream, but he that hath my word, and you all do, and we all do, we have his word. Speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like a fire? Yes, saith the Lord. And like a hammer, yes, that breaks the rock in pieces. The interesting thing about fire, Peter John was talking about this. The interesting thing about fire is whatever fire touches, it makes like itself. If fire touches that pew, that pew is going to be transformed to be just like the fire that touched it. The Word of God does that. The Holy Ghost does that. Let it just burn. Oh, how our hearts did burn within us, they said on the road to Emmaus on that Easter Sunday. When he walked with us, and beginning with Moses, going through all the prophets, he explained all things concerning himself. He talked to us about himself and how our hearts did burn within us. My word is like a fire, like a hammer. It just shatters. It cuts through. It, it, it changes stuff. Hard hearts, stony hearts, dead hearts. The word of God is like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. I am against, verse 30, these prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. Okay, okay everyone from his neighbor. To love your neighbor as yourself is to rebuke without holding a grudge so that they don't suffer the consequences of sin upon them. Sin is breaking the Ten Commandments. He's not going to tell you that. These false prophets, what do they do? They don't wait on the Lord. They don't talk to the Lord. They don't get understanding from the Lord. They steal their messages. Look at how he... Sad to say that's happening at all. This, listen to what he says about himself here. About a guy taking one of his sermons and preaching it at his church. He's taking the word of the, Lord, of the Lord and twisting what this piece of scripture means to suit his puffing himself up to be the only pastor in the world that this book is not written against. A lot today, too. That makes preaching real easy if you're a false prophet. There was a guy some years ago who got released from his church down in California because he was taking our Applegate messages and preaching them word for word, even to the place, to the place of where I was telling stories about my kids. He would put his kids' names in that story, you know, and he got caught and was dismissed and all that. There's people that just don't want to wait on the Lord and search the scriptures. And so they just steal words from, hey, that's a cool thing. I'll steal that little dealy bobber. See, instead of saying, Lord, teach me from your word. Search my heart. Deal with me. How are kids growing up and, and people that we're linked to in these days, how they need to hear what the Lord is showing you as you're in the word each day and opening up the word to speak the things that you say based upon the word of God. But these prophets wouldn't do that. They wanted to be popular and prosperous, and they steal their words, every one of them. I am against these prophets, verse 31, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith, thus saith the Lord. They would say, and they would spout out nonsense or Baal theology or their own dreams or whatever it might be. I am against them that prophesy false dreams, verse 32, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies, by their lightness, which means triteness. They're lying and they're trite. I sent them not nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit. They're non-profit prophets. They shall not profit this people at all. It's not going to affect people in the long run. They might have 15,000 in their congregation to just think, oh, this is so wonderful, but their lives aren't being changed because the word of God is not being heard. 
And this is what God is declaring in Jeremiah's day to a culture that's collapsing, to a country that's dying, to people that don't believe that, that say, we're going to be fine. Quit being such a prophet of gloom and doom, Jeremiah. And that's what they're going to say about you and about me, too. If we share the word of God, you're going to be rinsed on. Can you only imagine if I would call this pastor and confront him on this? There's so many things he said in this sermon that he would actually go against what, what his own words were if I told him the truth about what this chapter means against him. Jesus said that. But it's a rejoice and be exceedingly when that happens. For so did they to the prophets. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> I like that sneeze. They shall not profit my people, saith the Lord. Now, verse 33. And when this people, or the prophet, or the priest, shall ask thee, saying, what is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt say to them, what burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that say, the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man in his house. Thus shall, sh verse 35, shall you say to everyone his neighbor, to everyone his brother, what hath the Lord answered? What hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more, verse 36, God declares, for every man's word shall be his burden. You have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts. Thus, verse 37, shalt thou say to the prophet, what hath the Lord answered thee, and what hath the Lord spoken? But since you say, the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because you say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, you shall not say the burden of the Lord, therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and will forsake you, and the city I gave to you, and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence. And I, verse 40, will bring an everlasting reproach to you, and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. What's that about? Not only were they telling dreamy lies, and peace, and everything's going to be okay, even though you're like Sodom and Gomorrah, no worries. But they would say what God has to say. It's a burden, the burden of the Lord. This is just so depressing, and it's so heavy, and it's so sad. The burden. No wisdom at all. What is the Lord saying? Oh, it's the burden of the Lord. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my burden is what? Easy. And my load is light. What? What people think is burdensome. The Lord says, why are you calling it a burden? I don't ever want to hear that again. The things I'm telling you, God says, is to set you free. To keep you from bitterness and sadness and suffering when you don't need to be. To bless you. Oh, blessed is the man that walketh not in the council of the un nor stands around with sinners, nor sits in the seat of the snarkers, the scornful, but rather the blessed man, his delight in... Okay, I'm done with that guy. That's enough. He read it all. You hear what he's saying. It's absolutely ridiculous what he's saying. It's not talking about, oh, it's such a burden to do the will of the Lord. No, they're saying... Oh, it's the Lord's burden. It's not mine. We're saved by grace. Yeah, that's what that means. That's what he's talking about. Because they profane his word. They will not keep the holy covenant. Sacrificial law was done away with. The whole Old Testament tells us this story. So, when the Messiah finally comes and ends the sacrificial law, and we all know he became the sacrifice, he preached the Ten Commandments. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Because we don't have to do sacrificial law anymore. Monkeys like that shouldn't be teaching. He's a prophet for hire. That's Balaam. You're warned about that in the Bema Seat Judgment, Revelation 2 and 3. Don't have any part in that. Don't be listening to people like this. And they're all going to say foolish nonsense like this because they don't have the Holy Spirit. 
They have the antichrist spirit of error because they will not keep the commandments. And John very explicitly explains how simple it is to be born again. And when you are born again, it is so easy. Once you start to learn to trust the Lord, your life turns into a certain kind of a cakewalk. Now, some of us have to do more certain work, you know, reaching out to people, but we're all responsible to do that. That's, <coughs> <coughs> That's the elevation in the law. When he came and elevated those two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, that's Deuteronomy 4 to chapter 8. And you cannot change it. You have to read what that says to do and do it. It's in the second instruction of Deuteronomy to the end days people. Even the Pharisee in whatever chapter it was, I can't remember, 19 or 18 or something like that, when Christ asks them what's the most important commandments, he asks uh, the, the Pharisee to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He okay, I got a phone call. He says right there that you, the, the kingdom is close to you. Well, that means to follow all 10 commandments and to teach your neighbors to do so. That means you do not stone people. This Pharisee knew, he was one of the wise ones, he knew that the Lord was going to come, Yeshua, the Messiah, and he was going to elevate the law and end the sacrificial law. That's what they were waiting for, those who were wise. The Pharisees didn't want anything to do with that because they lost power. They lost power and the fear of, over people the traditions that they couldn't figure out because they weren't willing to listen to God. They were probably phony balonies faking it all the time. They loved the, because they were full of covetousness, you guys. They were making money, 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 money off God's people. He hates that, absolutely hates that. And this guy, I'm sure, has a full pocket. And so do a lot of these, these other pastors have a full pocket from making merchandise of God's people. They will not give up Easter because that's their big money-making doodad. Same with Christmas. They make a fortune at those times. Then they get all this money and they have a surplus like you wouldn't believe. If you took all the churches today, put it all together, world hunger would be gone. But they're not willing to give up their funds because it's a business to them. They're not even teaching the truth. And that whole chapter that he just read is preaching against his own self. Now, he may be one of the, the, not the, the least wicked out of those wicked wolves, but... And maybe he'll come to repentance. Maybe he'll see this video. Maybe I'll hashtag it. I think that's what you can do. Or maybe somebody else can. Or send it to him. But I'll tell you straight up. The, these, these people are preached against in that chapter. And they are the chaff. The chaff gets... He, the angels are going to come and gather the elect. The elect. The elect are Israel. Okay? They're all through the Old Testament. Jacob is my servant and Israel is my elect because the church goes apostate. So you better get grafted into the commonwealth of Israel and you can't do that without the holy covenants of promise. So that's your choice. That's where you have to come to repentance yourself and trust the Lord. Once you trust the Lord, then you receive the Holy Spirit of truth. And that's why you can go up against these liars, which you're supposed to do, by the way. And you're supposed to rebuke all sin in front of everybody so they learn how to fear. And everybody puts off that stuff to, to go on one thing that the wicked church changed around. The word usefulness to gentleness in the fruits of the Spirit. And no liar is useful to me, and no liar is useful, useful to our Heavenly Father. In fact, Jeremiah 23 is strictly rebuking all of those pastors and warning them to repent from their wickedness and twisting and profaning his word. Okay? So, come to the Sabbath gathering in a couple hours, I guess, maybe an hour, maybe two. I don't know. Isaiah, when he stops loving his pillow, will uh, we'll get up and, and, uh, and start the Sabbath space or give everybody pre-warning in advance, hopefully. And... Um, and we'll talk about more of these things. A lot of trouble. That pastor just read that all that scripture was against you. It's in the latter days you will consider this perfectly. I suggest you repent immediately and start teaching the people the truth. Get up on front of that stage and humbly ask for their forgiveness because you already taught them to forgive. So ask them for forgiveness and change your, your sun god day to Sabbath day because you're just following after Constantine and the wickedness of the pagan Roman papal seat. That's what they did. So don't do that. Get out of her, my people. 
So repent. That's so how you get out of her is to repent. That's how you do it. It's as easy as doing that. I did it. All my brothers and sisters did it. And we have a way better life now because we have the Holy Spirit of truth where we can actually understand what that book says as opposed to the days when we walked after the, the apostate church's wickedness lying to us every single opportunity they had. You'd get 50 answers for one question. Well, when you have the Holy Spirit of truth, the answers come to you very, very quickly and easily. But because the reason why is because nobody wants to obey the simplicity. His yoke is easy. His burden's light. He ended sacrificial law and his spirit indwells in you. And it's simple. You're simple. You're, you're, you're under his authority now. You know, you allow him to. He sups with you if you keep his holy covenant. He taught it every single day. They, people say that he didn't teach the Sabbath. Try to read Mark 1 with open ears and tell me he didn't teach. That's what it means to follow him. Keep the Sabbath. That's what it means to follow him. Keep my Sabbath. The, all the apostles or the disciples at the time, before they were disciples, they were all mending their nets. They were all fishing and working. And they had hired servants. And he says, come follow me straight away. On the Sabbath, they went into Capernaum and he started preaching with authority. They weren't even following the Sabbath, the disciples, until Yeshua said, come follow me. So then later on, Peter says, we forsook all to follow you. That's following the Sabbath. We forsook our ways to follow your Sabbath. Because they were lost sheep even back then, you know, of Judah. They were being misled by these Pharisees. And the reason why people, even I'll tell you this, you analyze that the Galilee is the Galilee of the Gentiles. So a lot of those lost sheep, of the house of Israel were probably gathered in the Galilee waiting for the Messiah to return because they were anticipating his return. So don't think that the apostles were all Jews. That's what, that's a clue for you in, in the book of John. The 144,000 have no guile in them because they're Israelites. The 144,000 are Israelites. The Israelites that are chosen, which the pastors are not feeding the sheep in this chapter we just went through, that's why he's going to raise up his own pastors to feed the sheep. Those are the ones that are the elect. They're going to be the kings and the queens over the Gentiles. He's not bringing any of that stuff up. It's all in that chapter as well. So, I don't know. I'll let you go. We'll end this conversation. And um, hopefully I see you all at the Sabbath gathering. It's always a blessing at some point in time. Come in and, and talk to us. Thanks. Bye.